Well, thanks for coming in this afternoon to talk about my favorite structure, the brain stem. And we're going to give you an approach. And I like to think about a highway. Choose your favorite highway. Mine's the New Jersey Turnpike. And of course, lying north in this scheme, representing the brain, is New York. And lying south, representing the spinal cord, is Philadelphia. And of course, motor information goes from New York to Philadelphia, and sensory information goes from Philadelphia to New York. And like every self-respecting highway, there are on and off ramps. In the brainstem, these represent the cranial nerves. So afferent information can come on to the brainstem via a cranial nerve, and efferent information can exit the brainstem via a cranial nerve. So on the Jersey Turnpike, exit seven is boarding town, but for the neurologist, it's the facial nerve. Now, if you don't drive or you've had your license revoked, there's always the fruit salad approach to the brainstem. Of course, the head of lettuce represents the brain, the apple, the midbrain, notice the four bumps representing the colliculi, the inferior and superior colliculi. We have the pons represented by a pair, the basis pontus, the banana, the medulla oblongata. And of course, when we cut the grapefruit, the cerebellum, we can see the folia of the cerebellum. So let's take a look at the gross anatomy. This is the anterior or ventral view of the brainstem. I like to call it the front of the brainstem. No need to get fancy. And no matter what we call it, in the front lie the motor tracts, the cortical spinal tracts. And that is to say that here are the cerebral peduncles are the cortical spinal tracts. Here in the basis pontus, the motor tracts. And in the pyramids, the motor tracts, which sets the stage for anatomical localization such that we know when we involve the cortical spinal tracts that we have an anterior brainstem lesion. Now, this is the posterior dorsal view of the brainstem. I like to call it the back. And at the back of the brainstem, we have a lumpy, bumpy appearance. And the reason why is that many of the cranial nerve nuclei or their fascicles are protruding in this back of the brainstem. So now we have another anatomical fact that many of the cranial nerve nuclei are sitting in the back of the brainstem. Now we're going on the water. Put your scuba gear on because we will show the lateral view of the brainstem. And here we introduce the 4-4-4 four, four, four rule of the brainstem. The first corollary of the 4 for four rule of the brainstem states that there are 12 cranial nerves. If you don't know that now, you're in trouble. You probably should leave Vancouver. <laughs> the second corollary is that there are four cranial nerves that exit the medulla. And you can count them off, 9, 10, 11, and 12. That helps in localization, now longitudinally. When we move up to the pons, there are four cranial nerves that exit the pons, and they are five, six, seven, and eight. When we go to the midbrain, we said we had four bumps. At the level of the inferior colliculus, an important way station for hearing, exits the fourth cranial nerve. At the level of the upper bumps, the superior colliculi, an important way station for hearing, exits the third nerve. Cranial nerve one goes up your nose bone, and cranial nerve two goes out the back of your eye socket. So now we're going to cut through the midbrain. And notice when we cut the apple that we do, in fact, have red nuclei where the pits existed. But here's a homemade diagram of the midbrain. And here we introduce one of the fundamental rules regarding brainstem localization. And that is to say that 
a brainstem lesion is characterized by a cranial neuropathy on one side, and on the opposite side of the body, there is weakness, sensory loss, or ataxia. And so let's take a look at the third nerve, the big mover and shaker of the eye. It moves the eye in, down, up, controls the lid, controls the pupil. As it courses through the brainstem, it will travel past critical structures. It will travel past structures responsible for cerebellar connections. And in that case, we will get a third nerve palsy on one side and a taxi on the opposite side. As we go more anteriorly, we cross the cortical spinal tracts or the peduncles, and we have the all famous Weber syndrome characterized and localized by the cranial neuropathy of three on one side and a hemiparesis on the opposite side. When we go down to the pons, we see further anatomical clues that help us localize. We realize that there are some cranial nerve nuclei that are very much in the midline, like six, while there are other cranial nerves that are out laterally, like five and eight. Likewise, the sensory tracts are separated transversely such that for vibration and position sense, they lie most medially, carried in the medial lamiscus. Out laterally, carrying pain and temperature are the spinal thalamic tracts, again allowing us exquisite localization as to whether or not something is midline or laterally. And of course, as we stated, the cortical spinal tracts lie anterior throughout the course of the brainstem. When we get to the medulla, the paradigm stays the same. We have 12 that lies in the midline, while 9 and 10 are out laterally. The medial lumiscus still in the center, carrying position sense of vibratory sense, and the pyramids carrying motor information. So let's take a case to put it all together. A 50-year-old diabetic woman has sudden onset of right-sided weakness involving her arm and leg and horizontal double vision. On exam, she had a right hemiparesis, a left abduction deficit consistent with the sixth nerve palsy, a left facial palsy, and vibratory loss on the right side of the body. So you put the 4-4-4 four, four, four rule into play, and you automatically say, at what level am I? By that rule, of course, with six and seven involved, I'm at the level of the pons. And I'm more midline because of the vibratory loss that she has. So here she is, left abduction deficit. And we see the widened palpebral fissure consistent with her left facial palsy. The anatomy is all here in which we captured with this lesion, the left sixth nerve fascicle, the seventh, involved the medial lumiscus and just extended anterior to catch some of the cortical spinal tracts. So we know with great detail, we're better than an MRI. Neurologists are better than the, than the MRI, particularly in the brainstem. And of course, the lesion is demonstrated here she had a hemorrhage exactly where you thought it would be. So I close with five important rules regarding localizing lesions in the brainstem. The first and most important rule is that longitudinal localization up and down the brainstem is determined by the cranial nerve that's affected and by the 444 rule of the brainstem. Transverse localization Again, determined by the cranial nerve that is involved because some lie in the midline and some lie laterally. Furthermore, the sensory pathways are also segregated medially versus laterally for the spinal thalamic pathways. The cortical spinal tracts lie anterior throughout the brainstem. And the hallmark of a brainstem lesion 
is that we have a cranial nerve deficit on one side and a neurologic deficit that involves the arm and the leg on the opposite side of the body, whether it be sensory loss, motor loss, or ataxia. Because we are in a highway, small lesions can cause devastating effects. And the final important rule about the brainstem is because it's a highway that carries motor information and sensory information from the body. If you have multiple cranial nerve palsies without any motor or sensory dysfunction in your body, the lesion lies outside the meat of the brainstem in the subarachnoid space, and a lumbar puncture is necessary in order to figure out the etiology of the patient who presents with multiple cranial nerve palsies. Thank you.